Extract 1. Questions from 1 to 12. You hear a doctor talking to a patient called Alejandro. For questions 1 to 12, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Good morning, doctor. Good morning, Mr. Alejandro. Can you tell me about your problem? Doctor, over the past week, I've been getting an increased shortness of breath. I have also developed some abdominal pain. However, I was continuing my regular activities until the other day when I passed out at home. My wife called paramedics and I was brought to the emergency ward. Oh, I see. Hmm. What's your age? 35, doctor. Your diagnosis report shows bilateral pulmonary infarcts and increasing BUN and creatinine. What medication you are taking? Heparin. Do you have any past history of any renal problems? No, doctor. I was feeling completely normal until recently. What about your appetite? It's good. Any swelling in your feet or ankles? No, doctor. Do you have chest pain? No, doctor. And your bowl and bladder habits? Normal. Any sudden weight loss? No, doctor. Your blood pressure level is 130 on 170. There is no organomegaly and no peripheral edema. Your laboratory reports show hemoglobin count 14.8, white count 16.3, sodium level 133. Potassium 5.1, chloride 104, and CO2 of 19. BUN test shows 26 and creatinine level is 3.5, and earlier it was 0 0.9. The CAT scan report of your abdomen shows poor perfusion to your right kidney. I think you have acute renal failure, probably vein thrombosis. Hypercoagulable state is indicated. Deep venous thrombosis with pulmonary embolism. Probably you have developed azotemia due to elevation of blood urea nitrogen, BUN, and serum creatinine levels. Your exposure to intravenous contrast materials may be the primary cause of your condition. I am going to prescribe you rivaroxaban 20 mg per day for anticoagulation. Hopefully with this anticoagulation, there will be some relief for your renal vein thrombosis. Or else, if your renal failure becomes progressive, I would advise dialytic intervention. I advise you to undergo a triple renal scintigraphy to investigate the three phases of your renal functioning system. In this diagnosis, a small amount of radioactive substance will be injected into your vein that is taken by the kidneys. This diagnosis involves the use of radioactive substance to investigate your kidneys and assess their function. Thank you, doctor. Extract 2. Questions from 13 to 24. You hear a physician talking to a patient called Mr. Zachary. For questions from 13 to 24, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Good morning, doctor. 
Good morning, Mr. Zachary. May I know what your problem is? I'm a patient of a gross inventorial doctor, and I was admitted to the emergency ward at my hometown for evaluation of my disease. When did this occur? Two months back, doctor. There. My CT scan showed no hydronephrosis or upper tract process, but there was a thickening of the left and posterior bladder wall, so they referred to urology. Okay. What's your age? 65. Brief me about your past medical history. A gunshot wound in 2000, followed by exploratory laparotomy twice. What medications are you taking now? Metaprol 100 mg, Diltiazem 120 mg daily, Hydrocodone 10 out of 500 mg, Pravastatin 40 mg daily, Lisinopril 20 mg daily, Hydrochlorothiazide 25 mg daily. Are you allergic to any medication? No, doctor. So, I advise you to go for a bladder biopsy and a workup for a right adrenal lesion to analyze serum cortisol, potassium, and aldosterone in ACTH level measurement. Get this completed and meet me again with the diagnosis reports. Okay, doctor. Hello, doctor. Good morning. Hello, Mr. Zachary. How are you? Have you got the diagnosis reports? I'm okay, doctor. Here are all the diagnosis reports. Hmm. The bladder biopsy confirms high-grade muscle invasive transitional cell carcinoma with muscularis purpurea in the specimen. But the other workup seems to be totally negative. I am really sorry to inform you that the transitional cell carcinomas are really very difficult to treat. Muscle invasive carcinoma is likely to spread to other parts of the body, and I have to get it treated either by removing the tumor or by treating the bladder with chemotherapy. I would suggest surgical resection of the tumor. However, the chance of reoccurrence is very common. You should undergo radical curative surgery in the form of a cystoprostatectomy with lymph node sampling. I would advise metomycin into your bladder along chemotherapy as 6 dose regimen after resection of the tumor. What is the chance for survival, doctor? Actually, I will have to treat this muscle invasive carcinoma more aggressively. Well, with your cooperation, I hope everything will go well. Sure, doctor. I will extend my full cooperation. I have full trust in your experience. That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. Part B, in this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you will hear people talking in a different healthcare environment. For questions from 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen to the audio. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at question number 25. Question 25. You hear two doctors having a discussion about chemotherapy for bladder cancer. Now read the question. Doctor, could chemotherapy inside the bladder reduce recurrence of cancer? According to a recent study, patients who had the chemotherapy drug gemcitabine placed inside their bladder following the resection of the tumor had few recurrences. Put of more than 400 subjects, 384 completed the trials and were included in the study, which randomized them to receive the chemotherapy drug called gemcitabine. To treat the bladder cancer, they implanted it into the bladder 
and let it settle there for an hour in the other group with saline without gemcitabine in it. They kept the patients under observance for every three months for two years, thereafter every six months for another couple of years. What they observed was the recurrence were 34% less. The purpose of this study was to prevent bladder cancer from invading the muscle wall of the organ. Moreover, this is a very simple method without any significant side effects. Question 26. You hear two doctors talking about the role of bacteria in colon cancer. Now read the question. Biofilms are complex communities of microorganisms that form on surfaces in many different environments, including the human body. While it is possible for biofilms to be shed from the surface they are attached to, it is unlikely that they would simply float through the colon with the stool. The interaction between the microbiome and the colon can play a role in the development of cancer tumors. The microbiome is a complex community of microorganisms that resides in the human colon and plays a critical role in maintaining gut health. However, when the balance of the microbiome is disrupted, it can contribute to the development of cancer. There is currently no evidence to suggest that biofilms alone can stick to the colon wall and form tumors. Tumor formation is a complex process that involves a wide range of genetic, environmental, and lifestyle factors. While biofilms can form on the mucosal lining of the colon and contribute to the development of certain health conditions, including inflammatory bowel disease, there is no direct evidence to suggest that they are a primary cause of tumor formation. Question 27. You hear two doctors discussing occupational therapy for improving visual function. Now read the question. Doctor, can visual function be improved through occupational therapy? Well, findings proved that occupational therapy for patients with poor vision performed at their home and directed particularly toward helping them with both meaningful and challenging tasks helped avoiding depression that actually improved the visual function as well. It was observed that those with milder visual impairment actually performed much better on these questionnaires after the occupational therapy group, whereas those who were in the supportive therapy attention control group could not improve their visual function measures. Therefore, the occupational therapy role not only improved in some of these depressive symptoms, but also in this specific subset of patients with mild impairment did improve their visual function as well. The comprehensive approach to rehabilitation, including in-home occupational therapy for those with visual impairment, is the key to improving visual function. Question 28. You hear two doctors talking about why primary doctors should not perform eye screening. Now read the question. Doctor. Why shouldn't the primary care doctor perform eye screening of the patients? Well, according to the recent recommendations of the United States Preventive Service Task Force, the primary care doctor shouldn't include a vision screening to the list of primary tests for his patient in his office. To know why vision screenings may not trace out the precise vision impairment, we need to look at the factors that can restrict the effectiveness of the results. 
Many vision screenings are performed only for distance visual acuity and it does not give any indication of how well the eyes work together or focus up close. It also does not give any detail about the eye health. Although certain screenings may include a plus lens test for farsightedness and eye coordination tests, even these screenings will often fail to detect many vision defectiveness. Often, a vision screening is conducted by primary doctors or administrative personnel who have little training, who haven't the complete knowledge to assess screening results, even if the screenings are performed in pediatricians or primary care physician's office. The scope of vision screening may be restricted by the type of lab equipment. Question 29. You hear two doctors discussing dysphagia after the use of breathing tubes in ICU patients. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. Is trouble with swallowing common following use of breathing tube? Breathing tubes are meant to save lives, and they are often used for critically ill patients as well as during various surgeries. However, using breathing tubes has a side effect of difficulty in swallowing called dysphagia. In the ICU, patients had breathing tubes down their throat, typically more than 48 hours, will have a minor difficulty of swallowing and some voice problem as the tube is pulled. If it becomes worse, it can last years afterwards. According to the findings, most patients in this five-year study recovered from their dysphagia within six months. However, there are also cases of the condition lasting up to five years. The good news is that even in patients with the prolonged periods of dysphagia, ultimately, they did recover some function. Question 30. You hear two doctors talking about risk factors for kidney donors. Now read the question. Doctor, how risky is donating one of our kidneys? Well, there is an online risk tool to calculate the long-term risk of end-stage renal disease in people who are willing to offer kidney donation. This tool includes many characteristics in contrary to single characteristics used earlier. This multitude of characteristics help develop a comprehensive picture of risk in donating a kidney. This tool incorporates 10 different characteristics that are specific to the person willing to be a donor and provides an estimation of the absolute risk of end-stage renal disease over a certain period of time, say 15 years. That is the end of Part B. Now look at Part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you will hear two different extracts. Choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at the extract 1. Extract 1, questions from 31 to 36. You hear the doctor briefing his juniors about different types of chest pain in female patients. You have 90 seconds to read the questions from 31 to 36.
Chest pain is one of the common health issues from the patients in medical OPDS that causes a lot of anxiety in the patient as it is often connected with a heart attack or angina and people are well aware of the severe consequences of the symptom. However, a chest pain is not necessarily caused by or originating from the heart diseases. There are numerous other structures in the thoracic cavity. Therefore, a systematic approach is crucial to arrive at the correct diagnosis causing the chest pain. A chest pain in menstruating females has a great significance, as they are less liable to get heart diseases until menopause. Estrogen prevents the development of atherosclerosis. Coronary artery disease or myocardial infraction is very rare in menstruating females. As menopause approaches and estrogen levels decrease, the chances of development of coronary artery disease increases. Reversible loss of blood supply to the heart muscle called angina pectoris or cardiac pain is retrosternal, poorly localized, vague, heavy, squeezy feeling, compressive. Angina pectoris rarely lasts for less than one minute or more than 20 minutes, unless it is a heart attack. Patients are relieved in less than five minutes on the use of sublingual nitrates or cessation of all activities. Angina pain can also occur in the left arm, left shoulder, the jaws, or neck. Sudden blockage of an artery supplying blood to the heart muscle called myocardial infraction would be similar to this but very severe and lasts longer. The pain will not be relieved by sublingual nitrate or rest and the symptoms are palpitations, nausea, vomiting, perspiration, blackout, dizziness, or even mortality. Pain that is unlikely to be of cardiac origin is often well localized, lancinating, prickly, sharp type lasting for less than 15 seconds at times. It can also be an aching type but mostly will be aggravated by coughing in deep inspiration. Often, the patient will be able to localize the pain with the tip of the finger. However, the pain that is localized just below the left nipple will never be from cardiac origin. Common Causes of Chest Pain in Young Females Mitral prolapse is a common and benign condition. Leaflets of the mitral valve are lengthy, redundant, and bulky. They prolapse into the left artium during systole. The causes of this pain are unknown. The pain occurs at rest, non-radiating, prolonged in duration and sharp. Mitral stenosis or rheumatic valve disease is a common rheumatic condition in females and can cause dyspnea and chest pain. The patient will have symptoms like expectoration, a cough, and there would be low-pitched rumbling diastolic murmur that will clinch the diagnosis. A 2D echocardiography will be confirmatory. Now look at extract 2. Questions from 37 to 42. You hear a doctor briefing his juniors about blood transfusion. You have 90 seconds to read questions from 37 to 42.
extracting blood or blood components products from one individual and inserting them into the circulatory system of another individual is known as blood transfusion. Therefore, the blood transfusion can also be considered a form of organ transplant. Generally, it is performed as a treatment for different medical conditions, such as massive blood loss due to surgery, trauma, shock, and other conditions in which the body tissues are not oxygenated adequately. Where carbon dioxide or other toxic materials are not effectively removed, and where the red cell producing mechanism fails. Great care should be exercised during a blood transfusion to make sure that the recipient's immune system is compatible with the transfused blood, and also that the donor's immune system is compatible with the recipient's immune system. Moreover, blood type classifications A, B, A, B, and O, and the rhesus factor classification, positive or negative, should be verified. Nowadays, a number of tissue type factors are also considered to determine histocompatibility. These tissue type factors become increasingly crucial in patients who receive many blood transfusions as their bodies have to develop increasing resistance to the transfused blood. Depending on the needs of the community, at the time only parts of the blood are taken for transfusion, blood is composed of red blood cells, platelets, and plasma. The platelets and plasma can be donated separately in a process called apheresis. In this process, blood is separated into components after being extracted from the donor. For instance, albumin protein is transfused for treating burns, and platelets used for treating hemophilia, cryoprecipitate, and immunoglobulin antibodies are transfused for treating immunological disorders. There will not be transfusion-related risk factors for the blood donor while transfusing the whole blood, besides the minute chance of infection or injury to the site. However, this is a certain risk to the donor when he donates plasma and has red blood cells reinfused. However, this risk is preventable by following appropriate sterilization procedures. Significantly, it has caused severe public health hazardous in China where they were often unregulated. The plasma collection centers of the U.S. are the best known examples of safe apheresis donation, which is maintained by pharmaceutical companies, involving paid donors up to twice a week. Interestingly, veterinarians occasionally perform blood transfusions to animals. Different species require different levels of testing to ensure a compatible match. Cattle have 11 blood types. Cats have 3 blood types. Dogs have 12 types of blood. Pigs have 16 types and horses have 34 types of blood. The experimental and very rare practice of interspecies blood transfusions is known as a form of xenograft.